Is this on? Can you hear me? Okay. Good morning, Desert Hills. Good morning. Well, I got to tell you, I don't think we've, well, at least as long as I've been doing this, we've never had five baptisms in one morning, but we do today. Praise the Lord. Yeah, praise God. This is a big deal. This is a big deal. Uh, the heater isn't working great, so I'm going to make this short, but let's pray. And then we'll get these guys and girls in here. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this time you've given us together this morning. I thank you for the witness of these um, that have come forward uh, in faith as the very first step of obedience. I pray, Lord, that you would direct and guide them. I thank you for them standing on the front line and saying that they believe uh, in the Son of God. We thank you for that. We thank you. For each one in attendance that gets to witness this, but we pray special blessings on the family members of these that are up here today. Guide and direct and protect them. We know you will. We thank you and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so first things first. Raymond, are you ready? All right. <laughs> it's a little cold. All right, sit right there. My feet are going to go right there. <laughs> Raymond, do you know Jesus is Lord and Savior? Yeah. <laughs> that was a yes. By the profession of your mouth, under the authority of this New Testament church, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ for baptism. And raised to walk in the newness of life. <laughs> Good job. It's a little chilly. It's a little chilly. Next we have Dominic. Yes. All right, Dominic, you can sit there and put your feet there. Dominic, do you know Jesus is Lord and Savior? Amen. By the profession of your mouth, under the authority of this New Testament church, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ through baptism, and raised to walk in the newness of life. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> Thank you. Praise God. All right. Next up is Zoe. Thank you, Christine. All right. <laughs> it's just a little chilly. It'll go fast. <laughs> okay, well, let me sit here. <laughs> Zoe, do you know Jesus is Lord and Savior? <laughs> Amen. By the profession of your mouth, under the authority of this New Testament church, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ through baptism. Raised to walk in the newness of life. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Danielle? Danielle is next. Okay, watch your step. Okay, let me sit here. And put your feet there if they'll reach. Will they reach? Okay. Danielle, do you know Jesus is Lord and Savior? Amen. By the profession of your mouth, under the authority of this New Testament church, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ through baptism, and raised to walk in the newness of life. <laughs> Praise God. And last, Hazel. How cool is that? <laughs> Hazel, do you know Jesus is Lord and Savior? Yes. Amen. By the profession of your mouth, under the authority of this New Testament church, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ through baptism. <laughs> and raised to walk in the newness of life. Praise God. Watch your step. All right, Miss Lana. Woo! Yeah. Praise the Lord. All right. Uh -oh. 
Good morning, Desert Hills. Welcome to our Sunday service. We're going to ask you to please stand and join us. Uh, as the children make their way up, they're going to lead us in our first song, our opening song. Hello! Our opening song, they will know we are Christians by our love. Hi, Luke. How are you? Good to see you, Miss Hayden. seated. Oh, it's good to see everybody this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, hello. Good to see you. Uh, did, did we have some baptisms this morning, I think? Yeah, amen. You know, God is so faithful. Uh, I asked him to continually stir the waters here, and boy, I tell you, he sure has. Uh, just when you think we're in a drought, then comes the deluge of salvations and believers' baptism. Uh, if you're here as a guest today, and I do see many friendly faces from the past, good to see you, Coach, and your family. God bless you all. Uh, if you're here today, know this, we're about Jesus. Uh, if, you're, if you're a guest here today, we're, we're about uh, following him in all the things that he did and taught us to do. And today, as we continue our study through the book of Hebrews, we'll be in Hebrews chapter 4, and we're going to be looking again at the rest of God, the rest of God. That is his rest, and he first speaks of it, he first speaks of resting in the verses I had uh, Brother Austin read. So I pray if you're here today and you're restless, uh, whether you be young and restless or old and restless, I pray that you'll find your rest in Him. I'm going to give you five different aspects of God's rest today. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about the Sabbath. A little bit about the Sabbath. Um, we have those Sabbath keepers, or Sabbatarians as they're called. I have found that, just like with any religion... There's always those, there's always those who key on a certain thing to brand themselves. What do I mean by brand? Um, years ago when I was little, 
er, <laughs> uh, I, I guess I started to get into brands. Uh, I was always too chubby to get into Jordash jeans. Um, I, I could never uh, wear straight leg Levi's because my thighs were too big. And my parents would not, if they could, would not afford Nike shoes for me. So as all my peers around me uh, began to brand themselves, and that's what you do when you put on the apparel, uh, you brand yourself as one who, who patronizes those brands. As all my, all my contemporaries, all the, of my friends and kids around me began to brand themselves, I became keenly aware that I had no brand, had no brand. The Sabbath keepers, their brand is that they worship on Saturday only. The Sabbath keepers, they, and then they, you have those Christians who brand themselves as vegetarians, that they will eat no meat, they only eat like they ate in the Garden of Eden. And, and truthfully, there's really not much wrong with that, except, except when you bypass, bypass the actual meaning of that specific time in the Garden, as well as, as well as what God intended the Sabbath to be. The Sabbath is a day of rest, but the Sabbath is much, much more than a day. The Sabbath is a person. And we're going to look a little bit at that today and see if you have actually entered God's rest. To be in Christ is to be in the Father, because Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And Jesus Christ became our Passover and our Sabbath day, our Shabbat, meaning we don't need to strive anymore to earn God's love. So we're going to look at the Sabbath day today in context of chapter 4, verses, hopefully, Lord willing, uh, 3 through 11, and we'll see, or 12 and 13. We'll see what the Lord has for us. Amen? Why don't you bow with me as we pray? Father in heaven, greatest God Almighty, I thank you, Lord, for this day. Truly, Lord, if there's any brand other than Christian, under the, other than child of God, other than your servant and your son, I would, I would claim to be a Baptist. Uh, this is the brand that we have chosen to call ourselves Baptists. As baptism is an outward sign of an inward change, it signifies the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, the only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ. But Father God, may we always and ever be associated with the rest that he brings, the rest to be at peace with you, no longer at enmity, but instead, Father God, at rest in you through the shed blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the powerful and empowering knowledge of his resurrection. Lord, I lift up our country to you as always. I pray for, um, uh, well, the servicemen at home and abroad, our political realm. Uh, I pray, Father, for the people of this country. They make up the country, not the boundaries and borders. Even so, Lord, uh, protect the United States that she might keep her sovereignty as you would see fit. Lord, I pray for the lost today, that the lost will come unto the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and that they might enter into his rest, enter into your rest. I pray, Father God, for any man or woman, boy or girl here today, who having entered your rest, has not yet made the first step in believer's baptism, showing your death, burial, and resurrection. And Father God, I pray that you continue to grow desert hills, and all, all those churches like unto desert hills those who have christ that are spirit filled bible believing god fearing and god serving christians we love you lord and i thank you for all things in jesus precious name all of god's people said amen and amen well if you'll turn with me back to exodus exodus chapter 20 i will start off speaking of that certain place that it is written as Hebrews speaks of these verses. And it's Hebrews chapter 20, uh, starting in verse 
9, Hebrews chapter 20, starting in verse 9. And, and these are the ten commandments of God. They're not ten suggestions, they are commandments. One of the things I want to get out of the way right away is this. For those who are Sabbath keepers, I hold not that against them. But I have found that when we become as religious as to hold one day holy, we oftentimes, well, allow ourselves a little unholiness, the other six. No, we are not called here as New Testament Christians to hold one day holy, lest we be found in breach, because Sunday, as the day of worship for the New Testament Christian, is not the Sabbath day. The Sabbath does not mean seven. It means it is Shabbat. It means a cessation from work. It means a cessation from work. Saturday is the Sabbath. Saturday is the Sabbath, at least as we know it in our Julian calendar. You see, there's a whole other calendar that the Hebrews have that they still hold, hold to to this day. But if we wanted to be legalistic about the Sabbath, we would be in breach of that commandment. But see, the Sabbath always had a spiritual condensation to it. And I pray that as, as the day unfolds before us in this message, you will find this spiritual connotation, this spiritual precept and principle uh, to be applicable to you and your walk in Christ. If not, well, either you're outside of Christ or inside of Christ. If you're inside of Christ, you need to start learning how to rest. Learning how to rest. That doesn't mean that we take six months off from our work. It doesn't mean we need a vacation necessarily. What it means is we must be secure in the promises of God. Amen or oh me. Well, here God writes in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 9, Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. Uh, the Sabbatarians, they, they don't even bother with that verse. But see, th this commandment isn't just keep the Sabbath day holy. It's that you must do all of your work in the first six days prior to the seventh day that you might cease from your striving. So I've used this uh, definition many times. If you've left one sock outside of the laundry and not undone, you have breached the Sabbath because all of your work has not been done. You say, well, that's silly. No, that's legalistic. That's legalistic. And that's what happens when we get into religion. When we get into religion and step away from the relationship that God intends for the born-again Christian, we can get very legalistic about the way we do things and how they are done. And in such, in such, we find ourselves in breach often. The Ten Commandments are not the only laws of God. You have the ceremonial law, you have the ritualistic law, and you have the dietary law. Thank God we're no longer under the dietary law. Amen? I know we've got some wrestlers in here. You're probably cutting weight. I, I, I feel bad for you. I'm probably going to have a hot dog this afternoon. Probably will not, probably will not be all beef, uh, meaning I feel sorry for those legalistic Christians uh, that will not eat pork. No, God has made all things lawful for us, but not all things are profitable. No, we, we, we no longer are held to one day a week to hold holy, but in these, in these Ten Commandments, this commandment, God says, in all, Do all thy work in the six days prior to the seventh, but the seventh day is the Shabbat of, the, of thy Lord, of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor daughter, nor their maidservant or maidservants, nor cattle, nor stranger that is in thy gates. How many people here, don't raise your hands, but how many people here go out to eat after church? Yeah, good for you. Well, it, that's good, but do you know that if we go out to eat after church and we were strict Sabbatarians and we were on a, uh, this was Saturday, you're technically making somebody else break the law. Why? Well, because they've had to prepare your food for you. The law is a school teacher. The, the law was and is and always was meant to bring people to the end of themselves and fall upon the mercies of God. That we might enter into the rest knowing that he is full of grace and mercy and love for all those humble enough to seek it. 
that doesn't mean that we go about breaking his commandments. No, but we should meditate upon his commandments, even as I pray you will meditate upon this commandment as you leave today. Yes, in all those uh, six days you're to do your work. On the seventh day there shall be no work for anyone or anything. For in six days the, Lord's ma the Lord made the heaven and, and earth, the sea, and all uh, that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Now, some people take this, the Bible critic takes this and says, Well, God, that's, a, that's a mighty strange God. He gets tired. No, that's not the rest that we're talking about. Remember, it's a Shabbat. This is the Lord's Shabbat that we honor. We honor the creation of God as we honor Him as the Creator by resting in Him as He ceased from His creative works. God ceased from His creative works. Did you notice that when God made the heaven and earth, He didn't do it again? Now, He's going to remake everything one day. Amen. When he made the fowl of the air and, and the fish of the sea, he didn't do it again. God's not into ritual, folks. God's not into ritual. God's not into religion. God made all of creation that he might enjoy it and he might have fellowship with the image bearers that we are. Uh, even in the New Testament, when Christ allegedly broke the Sabbath by quote-unquote working on it, by making mud, uh, and put with his spittle and put it over the blind, blind man's eye, Jesus proclaims that he is the Lord of the Sabbath, and that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So again, we see that this is not a burden that we are to keep as God's people. Rather, it is a person whom we are in and whom we honor. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all them that, it, that is in it, and rested the seventh day, Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. We can enter into God's rest through Jesus Christ. But there are five aspects of his rest that we must be concerned with. Turn back with me to Hebrews now. Because this is in context of the nine times that the word rest is mentioned in chapter 4 of Hebrews. The word rest is mentioned nine times in chapter, he, he, uh, chapter 4 of Hebrews. And, and uh, we'll start in verse 3. For we which have believed do enter into rest. This is the second of the nine times. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, that they shall enter into my rest. Although the works uh, were finished from the foundations of the world. Before the foundation of the world... God decided, and indeed, what God decides and what God proclaims is done. It is done. Nothing surprises God. He has foreknowledge of everything. And he is the one who planned to redeem humanity by way of becoming the sacrifice, even Jesus Christ himself. It goes on to say, For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day. I have already given you that. Genesis chapter 20 and verses 9 through 11. He spake in a certain place of the seventh day, this Shabbat. The Bible says uh, unto the Jews that they are to keep the Sabbath day holy, for it is assigned to you eternally, eternally. And even now, today, uh, or the Sabbath day, things are closed down in many, many places to honor God's Sabbath day. And yet, and yet, there still will be some work that is being done or some work that was left undone. Meaning there are those, no matter how hard they try, are still going to be in breach to that legalistic tense that the religious bring to their relationship with God. There are five aspects of, of God's rest I want to get across to you today. We are to rest in the peace of God. In the peace of God. The Bible says to be friends with the world is to be at enmity with God. Let me give it to you in modern day speech. You're enemies with God if you're friends with the world. Now yes, Jesus Christ came to die for the sins of the world, but not everyone will believe in him. Not everyone will receive him, and not everyone will enter into his rest. Are you at peace with God today? 
Are you at peace with God today? I know how most Christians walk. They walk one foot in the world and one foot in the Lord. Yes, they straddle the fence of belief and unbelief. They straddle the fence of the blessedness of brokenness in Christ and all that the world would have to offer. I will tell you this. Partial obedience is total disobedience. Partial obedience is total disobedience. And partial obedience will never gain you the rest that God would have for you. It will never gain you the peace that surpasses all understanding. God's rest has peace with God. God's rest tells us, and we should be seeking this, that we are free from the bondage of sin. God's rest means we are free from the bondage of sin. It was not until after, after Israel was delivered through the Red Sea. It wasn't until after they had been delivered and because of their unbelief that he began to give them these laws. Why? Well, because, because they still sought the bondage of Egypt. They still sought the bondage of Egypt. I hope she forgives me for retelling this story, but a good friend of mine was telling me about uh, when she retired. And she had spent many years, and indeed uh, our city and our children uh, profited greatly for her service, but spent many, many years in the school district and uh, as one of the absolute head muckety-mucks. And um, when she went to fill out her retirement papers, uh, I think she just recounted this story to me the other day, uh, I think she had filled them out and set them aside three separate times. And she explained to me that from this pulpit, uh, as my predecessor, Dr. Brown, preached, he began to preach about how Israel, going into the wilderness, began to lament and mourn to Moses. And they basically said, uh, were there no graves for us in Egypt that you brought us out here to die? And they began, to, uh, they began to moan and gripe because all they had was the supernatural food of manna for sustenance. All they had was a pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night to lead them. All they had was the ever-presence, almighty God to lead them. And yet, they still were worried about the garlic and the leeks back in Egypt. Now, I like garlic on my food. But I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll do without garlic the rest of my life to feast on the bread from heaven. The bread from heaven fills up. The bread from heaven satisfies. And the bread from heaven unleashes us, unleashes us, unshackles us from the slavery and bondage of sin. Does that mean that we don't sin? No. But as the old saying goes, it's not that we're sinless. We sin less and less. Amen or oh me. The rest of God means we are at peace with God and we are free from the bondage of sin. Don't look back and do not, do not envy those who are still in the world. Do not envy those who are still hustling and bustling. Do not envy those that are still getting it on and getting all the rewards for it. Because I can tell you this, without Jesus Christ, it is all ash in their mouth. It is all ash. There's coming a day when my Jesus I shall see. Amen or oh me. There is coming a day where I will lay all my rewards down at his feet. It matter not what I garner as an individual unless, unless the Lord buildeth the house, a man buildeth in vain. Whatever God has allowed you to achieve on this planet, it is for His honor and His glory. And, praise the Lord, our good. But we must always acknowledge God in all that we do, leaning not all on our own understanding unless we go astray. No, we acknowledge God in all that we do. Why? That He might direct our path. My friends, I don't know everything, and I don't know anybody who does, save Him. We must trust Him. We must follow Him. We must obey Him because He loves us and all the things that He would have for us are either for our protection or our provision. There is something to be said 
about taking a day. I praise God for each and every one of you who chose to come here today. You know, I learned this. I knew it, but then I learned it again at the height of the COVID. We had more stringent uh, contingencies here by way of uh, one of our members than any government had. And lo and behold, one of our people allegedly came into contact with somebody who had COVID the first month of the lockdowns. I had intended not to shut the church at all. But in compliance with our own contingencies, I had to. I had to. Because that person was Judy Bowen. Now, Judy's gone on to be with the Lord, not because of COVID, praise the Lord. But she's gone home to be with the Lord as recently as this year. But everybody that ever gets to me had to go through her. So technically, she had been in contact with everybody in the church. Well, I said, I'll tell you what. We're going to be in compliance for those two weeks, and then we are on the honor system. Because I'm not a babysitter, and I think these people have a sound mind. We've not been given a spirit of weakness and fear, but we've been given, uh, or timidity, we've been given a spirit of power and of love, and of a sound mind. Use your heads, people. If you're sick, stay home. I know Christians like to share, but I don't need your cold. Amen. Well, you wouldn't believe. They came out of the woodwork, and they told me, I mean, right in my office, right before a Wednesday night service, one of our ministers here, praise God, he's still here, he kicked in my door and said, you will have blood on your hands. And I said, I, I don't think so. And he goes, by way of you keeping this church open and continuing to worship on Sundays and Wednesdays, the death of those who may catch that virus will be your fault. I said, nope, because it's a choice. Who put a gun to your head today to come? Nobody here has to be here. None of you have to be here. We believe this is a divine appointment. We believe that God in his foreknowledge knew that every man and woman, boy and girl, in this building is here. And God knew they would be here. And dare I say, he led you here today. He led me here today. He said, well, it's your job. <laughs> there are other jobs I can do. I can do many other things. I can't lift as much as I used to lift. But I can do many other things. But it's my God whom I serve. It's my God whom I seek. It is our God who has bought us up out of the darkness of a sinful, dying world and placed us on high with His only begotten Son. I have peace with God through Jesus Christ, and it is available to anyone who wants it. Don't let your own intellect get in your way. No, we have peace with God. We are free from the bondage of sin, and we are delivered from Ritualistic religion. Um, I've been doing this uh, devotional in Hebrews, verse by verse, for many, many weeks. And I post them on Instagram and on YouTube. Uh, I'm in chapter 9 right now, and I can't get past the tabernacle. Because I've chosen to uh, uh, excise each and every article that was without and within the tabernacle and give explanation and make application to us today. Uh, I'm on, finally, the last uh, article within the Ark of the Covenant, which is the, tab uh, the tables or the tablets of the law, the Ten Commandments. As I've looked at these things, as I've looked at these things, undoubtedly I have seen the uh, mimicking of these ritualistic things that occurred in the Old Testament with Israel. One of the main things that struck me is something that, that has carried over both to the Greek Orthodox and the Catholic churches, which is the censer that carries the incense. Who here has ever gone to a Catholic uh, mass or a Greek Orthodox service? Okay, And you see the priest or one of the bishops, they're walking through the church with the incense and the censer. Right? And it fills the room, it fills the room with a, a smoke and a smell. Well, that is a hearkening back to the incense in the tabernacle and in the temple. And that's nice. 
That's really nice. But how many people that are going there even know that? In fact, how many people even know that that incense is meant to represent the praise and the laud and glory that the, God's people are meant to give him? As our praise, we offer the sacrifice of praise, New Testament teaching. We offer the sacrifice of praise. It goes before the throne of God like so much incense in his nostrils. Not that he has nostrils. No, see, it's deep, folks. The Bible's deep. But we're free. We are free from the ritualistic tense of all of those things. Those things were all written down as an example unto us, a foreshadow and a type of the perfect which has come. And that perfect is Jesus Christ. He did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. He came to fulfill them. And as he has fulfilled them, we are now free of those things. Those things are not bad, but they're unnecessary. See, God is the greatest painter there has ever been. He is the creator of all that exists. And yet, even after he created, he began to paint pictures, metaphors, if you will. And the Old Testament, although it is not all allegory or metaphor, there are things that are types and foreshadows of Jesus Christ and how we are to approach him in worship. We no longer, we no longer have the temple or the tabernacle or the sacrificial system. Why? Because Jesus Christ has made sacrifice once and for all. Praise God, there's one guy excited about that. The Lord just took a big sniff. He said, smells like Austin down there, you know. <laughs> Listen, when we enter God's rest, we are free. We are free. And again, I say all things are lawful for us, but not all things are profitable. Indeed, with this great liberty that we have in Christ now, we are commended and commanded not to use this liberty as a license to sin. But my friends, can I put this out there? We sin a lot more than we have to. We sin a lot more than we have to. There's so many things in life. Young people, if you're listening, say amen. I'm looking at you. You better say amen. Listen to me, man. There's so many things we can say yes to. That not, that not only can we say yes to, but are good for us and glorifying to him. But what do we do? We're drawn to the things that besmirch him, bring him no glory, and that are self-destructive for us. Why? Why? Why do we drink? Well, I have social anxiety. Hey, man, you need to get into God's rest. You have social anxiety. What can people do to you but take your life? In Christ, you will live forever. Don't just get over yourself, but get over people. That's how I'm able to come up here and speak to you twice a week. I am over all of you. You're just people. Ah, but most of you have been bought by the blood of Christ. So that doesn't just make you people, but that makes you family. And if you can't love your family, who can you love? No, it, God has given us a great liberty to live in. We are free to do so many things. And we are told we can do things that we ought not to. It's just not going to get blessed. I don't know about you, but I want to be blessed. I want to be blessed. I want to bring God glory. You know, we had, I don't know how many baptisms. I think we had four or five scheduled today. I was in hot-footing it, trying to get my last little thoughts together. I didn't get to witness them. But did you know that obedience b brings blessing? Yes, you know, uh, obedience brings blessing. When we make the first step of our testimony as being saved, why? Because baptism doesn't save you. Baptism is an outward sign of being saved from the inside out. As we are obedient through believer's baptism, we have every reason, every reason to think that we will be blessed. Well, I'll tell you this, though. Sure enough, as soon as Jesus was baptized, not for the remission of sins, but to identify with all those who would have their sins remitted and eradicated, what happened? Well, he ran smack dab into the devil. The devil never fights for what he already has, folks. 
No one gets out of here without running into him once or twice in life. So if your life has had some hiccups and speed bumps in it, know this, all of us have had that. All of us have had that. I'm not a used car salesman telling your life is going to be perfect when you come to Jesus Christ. What I'm telling you is you will have eternal life and he will perfect you even until the day you die. That's what I'm telling you. That's what I'm telling you. If you have the rest of God. Yes, we're at peace with God. We are free from the slavery and bondage of sin. And we are delivered from religious ritual. That's my personal definition. As Ken uh, has reminded me, if you look religion up, in, um, or religious up, in the Webster's Dictionary, it has a totally different definition. Well, the Webster's Dictionary is defining a word. I'm defining a spiritual stance. Religion is the repetition of ritual to stamp down a feeling of inadequacy. When I first came back, was coming back to my calling, I sat in a church meeting. Uh, it was a business meeting. We were at a house. We were meeting in a school. And uh, everybody wanted me to speak, you know. And finally, Gary Lancaster, he leaned over. He says, hey, why don't, why don't you say something? I said, man, I'm totally inadequate. I'm, I'm not going to say anything. And this guy got the strangest look on his face. And do you know, Joanne, from that moment on, Gary Lancaster very rarely left my side. And I go, man, Gary, how come you chose me to hang out with? He goes, everybody else in there is more than adequate. You're the only one who's humble enough to admit that you're not up to the task. I'm totally and utterly inadequate to do anything. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do everything that he wants me and calls me to do, including be ye holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. Not holier than thou. I don't, I don't measure myself against you. I'm not looking at your stats. I'm not looking at your good works. I'm not trying to compare myself to anybody. If I compare myself to anybody, it will be Jesus Christ, and I will ever and always fall short until that day. Until that day. And in that, we have this great liberty. We have this great liberty to walk free of religious ritual. Meaning, we don't have to meet on Sunday, and we don't have to meet on Wednesday, unless we want to honor the Lord who has said, do not neglect the gathering together of the saints, which is the custom of some. Some people take this liberty and they say, I don't need to go to church to worship. I can worship at home, in my kitchen, in my living room, on my boat, out at the lake. You know all that has in common? Self. It's all selfish. It's all selfish. But what did you do today? Now, I will tell you, when I first started coming back to worship, I came for me, man. And I still do. I still do. In my own alone time, I'm going to the Lord and asking him to help guide me. But when we come together, we come for him. We come for him and him alone. And as we come for him and him alone, invariably, as we humble ourselves, he begins to work with us and work inside of us. And his word begins to do a work in us. Prayer, study, and fasting is all good. But corporate worship, there's something about it. When the word of God is spoken over 150 to 200 people, it has a real amazing way of making every person in here feel like I or God is talking directly to them. Trust me. I spent 20 years in the back pew back there going, God, stop talking to me. You're beating me up every day. But that's one of the amazing things about corporate worship. But we are free from religious ritual. You know what else we're free to do? We're free to celebrate. We're free to celebrate. Uh, forgive me, I, I, I'm an American, not an American. I, I can worship him freely, at least for now. I'm an American, not an American. I can come here and worship freely and celebrate the risen Christ openly without fear of recompense or fear of anything. Why? Because I'm at rest in God. 
because the forefathers that we had that came to this nation came here primarily, the vast majority of them. Of course, there were those that were looking for gold and land and opportunity. I'm not speaking about them. I'm talking about our spiritual forerunners came here that they might be free to celebrate God. That they might be free to celebrate the fact that they are going to live forever. And know this, they suffered many hardships, many tragedies. Much blood was spilt for this opportunity that we have today, not to mention the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And we take it for granted. I don't. I don't. I, 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 I swore. I very rarely do this, but I swore during the COVID, I'll never take it for granted again. I'm never seeing George Ann, seeing Priscilla, seeing Austin and Ashley and the rest of you is a privilege that I have. It is a privilege, not a right. It is a privilege that we have. Why? Because we have been given these inalienable rights by our Creator. An inalienable right is a privilege that we have directly from God. He is unchangeable. He is immutable. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And He ever lives to make intercession for us. And we can celebrate that twice a week together. Can we not? Yes. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. All right. I've got to impress these wrestlers. You know, these guys came here today. They're bored out of their minds. I'm so glad you're here, Coach. Thank you. Your kids are growing up. Man, I can't believe it. They were this big last time I saw them. We are free to celebrate and worship, worship in the confines of our own conscience and the directives in God's word. We're, we're free from religion. You don't have to be here. You get to be here. No one has to come. Well, except for the kids who, whose parents bring them. But I pray that, you know what I, my, my biggest prayer has been, man, for since I became pastor, I have tried desperately to, to uh, communicate to all of, our, all of our little one's teachers. And, and this is a spirit that I, I think has been fostered in the youth for a long time. But, you know, uh, uh, from the preschool, the nursery on up to fifth or sixth grade, I pray that when our young ones leave, they don't go, they, they go to their friends, they say, what church do you go to? And, and their friends go to church. We don't go to church. And my prayer has been that this place will be so filled with love, devotion, and discipleship that the children that leave here will say, what do you mean you don't go to church? Church is awesome. Church is awesome. That's where I go. And they accept me for who I am, knowing that God, God is going to make me into something glorious. We're going to sing a song of invitation in a moment. It says, uh, just as I am. God says, yes, come just as you are. Let me change you. Come just as you are. Confess it before me. He says, come just as you are. Let me change you. I know how you are, but I, I want you to, ch to confess it before me. Totally inadequate. Totally morally bankrupt. Totally sinful. Have I murdered? No, but I've done almost everything else. I need God. That's the type of person God works with. Uh, Edith Reynolds' son told me a story once that um, he, knew, uh, he knew a man who has a, a national cleaning chain, and they sh shampooed and steamed carpets. And uh, as the owner-operator, he would go with his trainees the first two weeks and uh, see how they did. Well, this was one of the last couple days that he had a young man with him. And he said, now listen, we've walked the house, I've given the estimate, I'm leaving today. And when I get back, I'll inspect the work. And when I expect the work, uh, we'll see how you did. Well, the, the only operator of the cleaning business went away and he came back early. And there, there his uh, assistant was, one of the new hires, sitting on the bed of the truck where they had their equipment. He says, you done already? He goes, oh yeah, I've been done for about 20 minutes. He goes, well, let's go take a look at it. So they went in the person's house, and they were looking stem to stern. And lo and behold, he came across a spot on the floor. And he says, uh, can you come here for a sec? He says, sure. Well, he says, what is this? I thought you said you were done. He goes, well, that, that's dirt. He goes, 
You're, you're right. Go get all the equipment. And let me show you how to get it done. Well, he gets the equipment, and they pull it up. And he said, he pulls the young man aside later, and he says, I'm so glad that you confessed to me what that spot was. And the young man looked at him. He said, because if you had said anything else other than what it was, we couldn't work together. We couldn't work with you. He says, but because you called that dirt, dirt, I knew you and I could work together because you called it like it is. And that's, that's kind of the same way the Lord is. When we go before him and we make excuse and, and, and self-justify and, and we bring our own self-righteousness before him, don't you see the little old lady I helped across the street, Lord? Mm-hmm. But I'm talking, what about that lie you told? Well, you know I had to tell the lie. But when we come before the Lord and we confess it for what it is, Father, I have sinned. I am a sinner. I have sinned and I confess this before you. The Lord looks at and he says, all right, come here. Let's, I can work with you. I can work with you because, see, you agree with me. You and I both believe that that's dirt and that needs to go. No, the rest of God means we have peace with him. We have peace with him. We're no longer under the slavery of sin as we've confessed it to him. And we have repented of these things. We no longer need to go through the heavy burden of ritualistic religion. And we can celebrate all of this. We are free in the rest of God to celebrate. And we are free to have the confidence of God. Do you know God never wrings his hands? God's not worried about you. I had somebody the other day tell me in my office, I've disappointed God. Nobody disappoints God. God already knows. I'm full of stories today, probably because the wrestlers are here. They like stories. I, I got brought into Dr. Brown's office. He says, Scott, we, we, we think we would like to make you a deacon. I said, no, no, don't do that. Don't, do, don't, don't start talking that. You know, I'll, anything you ask me to do, I'll do. But don't. He says, well, why, Scott? And after a few minutes of coaxing, I just vomited it all out. This is what I have done. These are, this is who I have been. And he says, well, Scott, don't you think God knew that before he called you? I mean, this, he had such a way about him, Austin. He could just say the slightest little thing and take a 200 and heavy dude like me right to his knees. Well, I, I imagine so, Pastor. He goes, well, why don't you just let him continue his work in you and step in and step up to the confidence that he wants you to have. Not in yourself, but in him. Not in a day of the week, but in the person of Jesus Christ. And that way, you have every day of the week that is now holy unto God for all eternity. There's coming a day when heaven and earth will pass away and it will be made new by God. There will be no more moon, there will be no more stars, no more sun. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says, He will be the light in our midst. What do you think that is? That's an eternal Sabbath. And you can have it now. As His Word is a, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our heart. A light unto our heart and a lamp unto our feet. It casts no shadow. Do you know why? It emanates from the inside out. You see how rich we are? You see how rich we are? You see how restful I am? Five aspects of God's rest. You enter them in through one door. Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the door. Those who enter in, I will sup with. How about you today? Have you received the rest of God, the confidence of God, the freedom and the liberty that God gives? God didn't rest because he was tired. 
God ceased from his work of creation. God holds all of existence together even now on a Sunday and yesterday on the Sabbath. It's the Son who he wants us to enter. Not a day of the week, a person. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, what I want to tell you is you have nothing to fear from him. When he came to the woman who was found in the very act of adultery, and he said, those who are without sin cast the first stone, and they all went away. And she turned to our Lord. He said, are there none here to condemn you? She said, no. He said, then neither do I. Christ hasn't come to condemn and judge the world. Christ came that the world might have life and life eternal by his sacrifice. If you hear today, that salvation and forgiveness is yours for the taking if you will just confess to him.